Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 676, You Intisions? Camus was stunned to find Amandina here. His astonishment far outweighed any joy he might have felt. From the window above, Amandina noticed the four figures below. Her face twisted in alarm, and she disappeared into the house's shadowy interior. Taken aback, Camus called out, Don't be scared, we're here to keep you safe. While shouting, he raced up the stairs to the second floor of Tuanaku's residence. His visit to Palm Manor had confirmed Louis Berry's theory. The Dream Festival participants had lost control of their actions, driven by hidden malevolence and desires. Yet, their minds remained lucid, allowing for communication. Camus couldn't be sure if the possessed individuals would misinterpret others' words. Furthermore, this wasn't true clarity of thought. They wouldn't realize they were dreaming, and the experience would fade upon waking. Thump, thump, thump. Camus and recharged into the building, taking the steps two at a time. Behind the house, out of sight, a glass window set in wooden planks swung open. Amandina, clad in black hunting gear, nimbly climbed out. She used the wall's protrusions and crevices to swiftly descend to the ground. As her feet touched the earth, she noticed a figure watching her from the side. It was Lugano, his right arm ending in a bloody stump, his face marred with crimson stains. He looked a frightful mess. Amandina's heart clenched. She pressed her back against a pillar supporting Tuanaku's house, fists tightening as she shut her eyes. In the same instant, Lugano's eyelids drooped, his mind growing hazy. He collapsed to the ground, falling into a deep sleep where he lay. Amandina's eyes snapped open, no longer using her power to force the battle-worn man into slumber. Doing so would trap her in a profound sleep, able to act only in her nightmare form, her body immobile. And the man wasn't alone. Before Lugano could wake naturally, Amandina turned to flee, seeking a safe haven to conceal herself. At that moment, she heard a smirking voice. So you're a Bayonder too. Amandina instinctively glanced over and saw the adventurer, Louis Berry, standing before another wooden pillar supporting Tuanaku's house, not far from her. The handsome Louis Berry, with his dark hair and emerald eyes, had one hand in his pocket as he leaned against the pillar. His feet were crossed behind him, and his lips curled into a playful smile as he looked her way. The dim crimson moonlight of the night lent him an air of enigmatic and sinister allure. Amandina tightened her fists once more and closed her eyes. However, her spiritual senses told her that Louis Berry had vanished in an instant. She couldn't find the target and couldn't use her corresponding abilities. Moments later, Amandina, with her heightened spiritual perception, cast her gaze towards the shadows on the ground floor of the house. She sensed something stirring there. At the same time, Amandina heard an illusory and ethereal voice. We mean you no harm. We're not affected by the dream festival. Amandina, who was about to use her spiritual perception to lock onto the formless presence in the shadow, was taken aback. Just then, Camus and Ree ran to the corresponding window and called out to Amandina. We're here to protect you. We have enough self-control. After assessing the number and strength of the two sides, Amandina asked skeptically, Why aren't you affected? As she spoke, she locked onto the formless entity in the shadow, believing it to be the strongest among the opposing group, the adventurer Louis Berry. If she discovered anything amiss and something went awry, controlling Louis Berry first would effectively increase her chances of escape. Lumian's body emerged from the shadows. He glanced at Lugano, who had regained consciousness and stood up, and inwardly praised Amandina's keen spiritual perception. Then he smiled at Amandina and said, Surely you've noticed that we've been entering and exiting this house frequently over the past few days? What about you? How are you able to maintain your normal self-control? Amandina glanced at the house beside her, no longer puzzled by Lumian and the other's ability to remain lucid and rational. She pursed her lips and said, Robert took me on a date to Twanaku's place. I spent half the night here. Camus's heart ached as he blurted out, Robert knows what's special about this place. Amandina nodded nimbly. 
He knows the Dream Festival very well. What's his relationship with Twinaku? Lumian asked thoughtfully. Amandina pondered for a moment. I don't know. At the very least, I haven't noticed any romantic tension between them or any interactions. What do you mean by romantic tension? Lumian didn't directly inquire about Mr. P Robert's knowledge of the Dream Festival. Instead, he asked something else. Are you a Bayonder of the Evernight Pathway? Amandina blinked and hesitantly said, in a way. Upstairs, Camus inquired with concern, where did you obtain the potion formula and the corresponding ingredients? As they conversed, various movements and shouts echoed from the plantations outside the town and throughout the town. Amandina's eyes darted around as she grinned and said, Can I choose not to answer? What do you think? Lumian smiled at her. Amandina didn't back down. She raised her head slightly and stared into Lumian's eyes without flinching. She noticed that his smile remained unchanged and his emerald green yet deep eyes remained emotionless. After more than ten seconds, Amandina averted her gaze and tilted her head slightly. I obtained it in this dream. Camus, who was on the third floor, was taken aback. You obtained it during the dream festival? He could understand obtaining a potion formula during the dream festival. While knowledge gains could be replicated in reality, could Bayonder ingredients used to concoct potions be brought from the dream to reality? Could it be that after consuming a potion during the dream festival, one could also remain a Bayonder upon waking? This subverted much of mysticism's common sense. Without waiting for Amandina's confirmation, Camus thought of a possibility. He immediately asked Amandina, Are you a Bayonder only in this dream? Amandina wanted to play dumb, but after glancing at Louis Berry, who was looking at her with a faint smile, she said gloomily, It's the same in reality, but I don't have many chances to showcase it. How is this possible? Camus gazed down at Amandina, suspecting that the mystical knowledge he had encountered since childhood was inaccurate. He had considered the possibility that Amandina was lying, but he wasn't willing to doubt this girl who held a special place in his heart. At that moment, Lumian spoke calmly to Amandina, his expression unperturbed. You haven't consumed a potion, have you? Amandina's expression shifted slightly. She puffed up her cheeks and muttered, why are you still asking me if you already know? Haven't consumed a potion? Camus, Re, and Lugano were taken aback, but as they recalled their encounters, they gained a better understanding of Amandina's situation. It's indeed a boon, but I'm not sure how it was accomplished. Lumian silently smiled as Camus nervously asked Amandina, Which evil god deceived you? Amandina was bewildered. Evil god? What evil god? Before Camus could explain, Lumian asked thoughtfully, How did you obtain these supernatural abilities? Amandina scoffed. Why should I tell you? In the next moment, she saw Louis Berry reveal a smile that inexplicably terrified her. It's it's Robert, Amandina said with a shiver. He took me into the forest outside and led me to a huge black stone. He asked me to place my hand on it. And then you became a Bayonder? Lugano interrupted Amandina with surprise and curiosity, failing to abide by his duty as a servant. Amandina shook her head. Then I fell asleep in the dream. When I woke up, I had superpowers. Is Robert also a Bayonder? Did he obtain his powers through the same method? Camus pressed. Amandina let out a soft sigh and said, He's a Bayonder, but I don't know if he obtained his abilities the same way. He brought me on a date here. Before entering this dream, he was already a Bayonder. Black Boulder, Lumian emerged from the ground floor of Hisoka's house and asked Amandina with a smile, Where's Robert? He's not having a date with you here? Amandina's expression shifted between anger and amusement as she replied, He wanted to visit his other lover before coming to me. He has another lover? Who? Camus asked, suddenly angry. Amandina's eyes darted around, and she hesitated for a moment with a strange expression. Padre Kali. Ah, uh, huh? Camus, Re, and Lugano couldn't help but exclaim in shock and confusion. Even someone as well read as Lumian couldn't help but raise his eyebrows. 
Amandina spread her hands and said, He does like women, but he prefers men. He said he brought me into the dream to obtain superpowers because he felt guilty towards me. He was also grateful that I was willing to help him keep it a secret and not break off the engagement, continuing to go out with him, make out with him, protecting his image even after knowing his other side. At that moment, Camus and Ree remained silent, but Lumian sensed the same meaning in their eyes. You and Tisions? Amused, Lumian asked Amandina, and you can accept that? Amandina pondered seriously. Why not? As a marriage partner, Robert excels in status, wealth, strength, looks, and skills. In the southern continent, there aren't many better choices. Besides, we did have a beautiful relationship. He does love me, but he also loves Padre Kali. Amandina smiled at Lumian and said, He also promised me more freedom. Upon hearing Amandina's response and looking at the youthful and beautiful girl, Camus, who was on the third floor, suddenly felt a pang of sorrow. A certain beauty in his heart shattered. Lumian glanced up at him and scoffed inwardly. Hadn't he been mentally prepared to see the other side of Amandina? Amandina managed to express herself succinctly in a very self-controlled manner without demonstrating it. Perhaps Amandina had deliberately said so much in front of Camus to prevent him from loving her out of pity. Lumian turned to Amandina. In other words, Robert is currently in St. Seen Cathedral. Yes, Amandina nodded. Lumian tersely acknowledged her words and spoke in a commanding tone. Then let's pay him and Padre Kali a visit. Chapter 677 Last Year's Dream Festival Amandina hesitated for a few seconds before saying, You've already cornered me. What choice do I have? Her eyes flickered with an inexplicable excitement and curiosity as she spoke. Her words seemed to convey a different message. I didn't want to. I had no intention of doing so. You forced me to go to St. Seen Cathedral. Hurry, let's go. Are you trying to broaden your horizons? Lumian criticized but didn't expose her. He pointed at Hisoka's house and said, Before heading to St. Seen Cathedral, let's check this place first. Amandina tersely acknowledged his words. Are you trying to find the source of its uniqueness? Give up. I checked during the last dream festival and just now, but I found nothing. As she spoke, she followed Lumian at a brisk pace, anticipating what this seemingly formidable adventurer would discover. Lumian reached the second floor of Hisoka's house, where Camus and Ri were already waiting. Surveying every corner, Lumian casually asked Amandina, Are you familiar with Twanaku? Amandina wasn't surprised by the question. Since she was searching for the source of the abnormality in Twanaku's residence, she couldn't avoid gaining a better understanding of his situation. She shook her head and said, I'm not familiar with him. I've only encountered him once or twice. I was just a child when he lived in Tizimo. Most of the time, I studied at the Iris Grammar School in Port Pylos. Later, he only returned to Tizimo two or three times a year, spending a week each time. It was evident that Amandina had secretly learned about Twanaku. After all, she had only entered the special dream because she had slept in his house. She had even remained fully lucid during the dream festival. Without waiting for Lumian to ask a new question, Amandina glanced at him and added, Twanaku returns every year for the Dream Festival. Last year, during the Dream Festival, when Robert and I returned from the Blackstone, we noticed someone approaching. We hid behind giant trees on both sides of the path and saw that it was Twanaku. Twanaku is indeed connected to the Black Boulder, there are even traces of him or marks formed by extreme emotions and desires there. Lumian turned to Camus, who was watching him and Amandina stroll around the second floor, and pondered for a moment. Which month did Twanaku's house burn down, killing all his family members? Without waiting for Camus's response, Amandina exclaimed excitedly, I know, I know. Yes, I'm asking you. Do you think I don't know when Twanaku transmigrated? Lumian smiled at Amandina, signaling her to respond. He had a clear and detailed understanding of Twanaku's matters on the surface. He had deliberately asked Camus to elicit Amandina's answer. 
He wanted to see if she would lie and if she had any further information. Amandina said smugly, Late December. It should be a few days after the Dream Festival. As far as they knew, the Twanaku family likely perished during the Dream Festival. Upon returning to reality, their fates began to unravel, and they were taken away by the fiery disaster. The question is, why did this house leave behind an abnormality? What happened to the Twanaku family back then, or what had they done? As the bestowed of the inevitability domain, Lumian found a term that was very inevitability-like to summarize the phenomenon of those who died for various reasons in the next three months after dying in the Dream Festival and returning to reality. Reigning in fate, of course, he couldn't be certain that death in the Dream Festival would lead to death in reality. However, judging from Amandina's expression and tone, Lumian believed that she thought the same. After searching the second floor and finding no differences from reality, Lumian ascended the stairs to the third floor. Amandina followed closely, her excitement showing that she finally had a chance to do what a Bayonder should do. Lumian glanced at her and casually asked, What left an impression on you during last year's Dream Festival? Amandina's excited expression darkened, as if she had been reminded of something unpleasant. She covered her mouth and nose. After a few seconds, she said, Robert and I discovered numerous cruelly murdered individuals in the town and various plantations. Their stomachs were ripped open, and their internal organs were removed. They wore pained expressions, as if they had been tortured to death. Serial killer, Camus, who had been listening intently to Louis Berry and Amandina's conversation, blurted out. This reminded him of Twanaku. Was this desire apostle venting his murderous desires during the dream festival to show restraint normally? So that's how it is. Lumian roughly understood how Hisoka's advancement ritual had been completed. Following the ritual, Hisoka had killed enough people in this realistic dream and devoured their internal organs. When he returned to reality, these people died one after another. From fate's perspective, they had indeed perished because of Hisoka's murder. This fulfilled the core requirements of the ritual. Hisoka only needed to truly devour a portion of the victim's internal organs before they were buried. He should be able to complete the ritual, consume the potion, and advance to desire apostle. In reality, completing a series of murders and stealing a corpse's internal organs were two entirely different matters. What puzzled Lumian was that according to Devilology, such an advancement ritual required a three-day interval between killings. Otherwise, it was easy to lose control. The maximum interval couldn't exceed nine days, or the ritual would reset. Pisoka had clearly used the Dream Festival to complete all the killings in one night. When he returned to reality and the primitive tribe attacked, all the condemned people died on the same day. It didn't drag on until the next month. Lumian believed that it was due to the April Fool's prank. They had taken advantage of the chaos to send the deceased, whom the primitive tribe couldn't eliminate in time to hell. This could be confirmed by the statements of the peripheral members of April Fools. In other words, the interval of no more than nine days was satisfied, but Lumian didn't know how Hisoka had achieved the criteria of exceeding three days. Had he used the dream's uniqueness to avoid the three-day interval? When he killed someone in the dream, it hadn't been reflected in reality, so he wouldn't lose control so easily. As Lumian pondered Hisoka's advancement ritual, he circled the rooms on the third floor. After searching the room where Twanaku slept, he smiled at Amandina and said, Apart from the serial murders, what else did you encounter? Amandina pursed her lips and furrowed her brow, after a brief struggle, she grumbled, If I cooperate, will I be awarded a medal when I return to reality? Her father Petit had once received the Legion of Honor medal from Antis, so he was made a knight. Without waiting for Lumian's response, Amandina continued, I also encountered a woman who seemed like a lunatic. Back then, I wanted to visit the Briou Motel to see how the gentlemen and ladies hunting in Tizimo would react in such a dream. I was looking forward to seeing their other side. When I reached one of the rooms, I heard a few people singing a strange song. Then the crazy woman appeared behind Robert and me. She remained lucid. 
she was quite beautiful, but she was very crazy. Back then, I was like a child with a new toy. I always wanted to test my abilities. I felt that with Robert's cooperation, I could easily deal with most Beyonders. One controlled, and the other attacked. In the end, she captured the two of us. Robert was knocked out, stripped naked, and hung from the bell tower with a bunch of mosquitoes released beside him. I, I was hung in a cesspit, descending bit by bit. At this point, Amandina appeared on the verge of vomiting. In Tizimo, other than the Briu Motel, St. Seen Cathedral, the police headquarters, and a few other places, no one used a flush toilet. Camus couldn't help but sympathize with Amandina as he imagined such a scene. Mad Lady? Were the ones singing the peripheral members of April Fools who participated in the Tizimo prank? Lumian circled the third floor rooms and smiled at Amandina. And then? Amandina took a deep breath and said, she also asked me why I stayed lucid. After I told her about Robert and Padre Kali, she happily ran to St. Seen Cathedral and completely forgot about me. After that, I gradually escaped my predicament. With a nod, Lumian replied, let's go to St. Seen Cathedral now. He planned to consider using the mystery prying glasses and the Eye of Truth in Hisoka's house in the dream after obtaining more information from Padre Kali and Robert. All right. Amandina tried her best to appear less eager, but she really wanted to see how Robert, her fiancé, interacted with Padre Kali. The five of them left Hisoka's house and hurried towards St. Seen Cathedral. Lumian didn't use teleportation because he didn't want to waste his spirituality. He couldn't carry anyone with him in his flaming spear form either. Fortunately, Tizimo wasn't large. They quickly followed the shadows by the roadside and returned to the intersection where the Briu Motel stood amidst various cries. Lumian pointed at the Briu Motel and warned Amandina, Don't go to the second floor of the Briu Motel. Trust me, it'll be even more terrifying than what that crazy woman put you through. Amandina's eyes narrowed as she said, Okay. The five of them turned onto another street, passing through the Bunya Cafe, the police headquarters, and a small square before arriving outside St. Seen Cathedral. Lumian wasn't in a hurry to enter. He circled to the side, pried open a stained glass window, and peered inside. He and Amandina, who had gathered beside him, nearly went blind. In the cathedral's hall, a handful of naked men knelt before the eternal blazing sun's altar. They were all from the northern continent, including Amandina's fiancé, Robert. Padre Kali, also naked, paced back and forth between Robert and the others with an excited expression, reciting, He walks in the light, he sheds warmth, he illuminates the world. With each line, Padre Kali seemed to grow more animated, exhilarated in various ways. Chapter 678 Absurd Orgy Amandina scrutinized the naked preacher, Kali, from head to toe. Her gaze eventually settled on Robert, her fiancé, kneeling beside him. The lad with brownish-yellow hair, his skin pale white as if he had not been exposed to the sun for a long time, had abandoned his usual cold demeanor. He was equally excited, but he controlled himself and patiently waited for the padre to complete his preaching. The other naked men grew increasingly restless, gradually stirring. However, it was evident that they held Padre Kali in high esteem. Despite their disintegrating self-control, they refrained from directly initiating the orgy, only occasionally making small movements. If God were watching, he would have incinerated all of them. As a believer in the eternal blazing sun, Amandina subconsciously wanted to kneel to the side and bow her head in repentance. What a blasphemous scene. Holding the open sun Bible, Padre Kali continued to impart the teachings of the eternal blazing sun to the naked men with an abnormally excited expression. God says, the sun shines justly upon everyone. During the preaching, Padre Kali's gaze frequently swept across Robert and the other purebreds of the northern continent, their faces, chests, and lower bodies. His expression revealed uncontrollable satisfaction pleasure, and enjoyment. Lumian had always felt that he was well-read. In the past, he had disrupted the church's holy operations, but the scene before him still exceeded his imagination, 
leaving him momentarily dumbfounded. Are the Padres of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church among the most outstanding intisions? In an instant, information about Padre Kali and the observations of the past few days appeared in Lumian's mind. He's a native of Port Pylos, possessing pure West Balam bloodline and a lowly native of the southern continent. Starting as a cathedral servant, he had seized the opportunity to change his fate. Subsequently, he had worked diligently and eventually became the padre of Tizimo Town. He yearns for higher status and more recognition, especially from those hailing from the northern continent. Such long-standing desires have distorted the desires of Padre Kali. Is he secretly targeting men from various countries in the northern continent, attempting to subdue them and gain his sought-after recognition? Robert and the others are clearly relatively young. If Padre Kali had started doing such things a few years ago, they would still have been minors with immature minds. Tesk you Padres, as Lumian analyzed the current situation, he thought of his sister Oror. In Cordu, he had not liked entering the cathedral, attending mass, or praying often. On the one hand, Oror did not like it herself and set an example. On the other hand, Oror had always been worried that Lumian, who was only twelve or thirteen years old at the beginning, would be alone with the clergyman in the cathedral. From time to time, she would use words like, boys have to protect themselves, and many padres like boys. Suppressing his sudden longing, Lumian looked at Padre Kali, who was still engrossed in his preaching. The more he preached, the more excited he became. Lumian felt that his analysis should be correct. A lengthy holy sermon before a male orgy was clearly not something an ordinary person could come up with and put into practice. It was abnormally absurd. However, considering that Padre Kali yearned for the northern continent gentleman's recognition, especially given his identity as the eternal blazing sun church's padre, all of this became self-explanatory. Poor eternal blazing sun and saint scene. They have become an important prop for Padre Kali's performance art. Just as Lumian thought this, Padre Kali finally completed his exciting sermon. He spread his arms and shouted, Praise the sun! Robert and the other lads, equally excited and naked, knelt on the ground, spread their arms and sang in unison, Praise the sun, praise his grace. The sun does not wish to be praised by you, his grace. Yes, it aligns with the aspirations of Padre Kali for higher status. In this male orgy, he made all participants view him as an archbishop and preached to them. Finally, he would bestow the boon of God's Holy Spirit on these people. Lumian seemed to be able to imagine the ensuing scene. Padre Kali turned around in satisfaction and solemnly placed the Bible back on the altar. Then he approached Robert, resembling an archbishop bestowing grace upon his believers. The other men tangled with each other. Camus, Re, and Lugano, who were observing the cathedral through another stained glass window, were equally stunned. In particular, Re felt as if her eyes, brain, and soul had been tainted despite all her tragic experiences. Upon regaining her senses, Re's anger surged. Beside her, Lumian recalled a detail. He lowered his voice and asked Amandina, When did Robert become lovers with Padre Kali? Amandina retracted her corrupted gaze and pondered for a moment. More than a year after Padre Kali arrived in Tizimo, about three years ago. Lumian frowned and asked, Did they become lovers in reality or during the dream festival? Of course in reality, Amandina replied without hesitation. Something's off. Padre Kali had been in Tizimo for over a year. He should have mellowed, turned restrained, and been devoid of excessive desires and emotions. Why was he still targeting Robert and the other lads? From the looks of it, there is something abnormal about Padre Kali, and this abnormality should have been related to the source of the Dream Festival. That is why he had declared its beginning. Just as Lumian thought this, he saw Re raise her bow angrily and aim it at the cathedral, where the scene was becoming increasingly unbearable and foul. Almost simultaneously, the energetic Padre Kali turned his body. Suddenly, Lumian, with one hand in his pocket, saw the native padre with dark brown skin, sunken eyes, and thin black hair. 
His naked figure was reflected in Lumian's eyes. He felt a chilling aura emanating from Padre Kali's body, attempting to completely freeze and replace his spirit. Wraith Possession So, Padre Kali possesses the ability to transform into a wraith. It is no wonder that when I investigated his weaknesses, I realized that it only existed deep within the body, within the spirit. Hinihi, a wraith preaching in the eternal blazing sun cathedral and under the sunlight, who would have thought such a thing would happen? Padre Kali's wraith powers definitely had not come from drinking potions. They would definitely have been discovered and purified. A boon? Lumian came to a realization. Relying on the strength of his sequence five spirit body, Lumian struggled to wrestle control of his body from Padre Kali. He was not in a hurry to activate the Blood Emperor's aura brand. Instead, he looked at Amandina and said with difficulty, word by word, let me and Kali enter a dream. Lumian knew that Amandina's ability to forcefully pull people into a dream could only be used one-on-one. -on -one. However, Padre Kali was currently attached to him and entangled with his spirit body. Perhaps she could treat them as a unit. As for whether Wraiths dreamed, Lumian did not know for now. After all, he still had a backup plan. With a resounding crash, Ree's arrow shattered the stained glass window, sending shards crashing to the ground. The arrow, entwined with silver-white lightning, crossed a distance of more than ten meters, pierced the location where Padre Kali had been, and nailed it to the wooden table with the candlestick. Amidst crackling lightning, the long wooden table shattered and collapsed to the ground, sending burning candles tumbling in all directions. Robert, clearly taken aback by the sudden departure of Padre Kali, reacted. He opened his mouth and uttered strange words in a strange language. Uo! As if a cold wind from the Faisak Empire's extreme north blew, a blurry, strange, and inhuman figure materialized out of thin air and burrowed into Robert's body. A layer of armor like ice materialized on Robert's body, and a colossal, sharp, and crystalline frost scythe materialized in his hand. Clutching the massive scythe, Robert sprinted toward Re, Camus, and the others. Wherever he passed, the ground froze and icicles materialized on the walls. On the fourth floor of the Brio Motel, in a room near the intersection, two figures emerged from behind the curtains as Lumian and his companions made their way to the street where St. Seen Cathedral stood. One of them was a man with distinct northern continent features. His dark green eyes stood out against his dark gray formal suit and black silk top hat. The other was a woman with delicate skin, exquisite facial features, and deep blue eyes. She wore a light-colored dress that allowed for easy movement and a feathered hat adorned with pearls. They were the couple Lumian had seen moving into the Briu Motel late at night. They had arrived in Tizimo a mere ten minutes before the official Dream Festival began. At that moment, the man and woman's eyes were clear, devoid of any excessive emotions or actions. The patrol team's sudden arrival in Tizimo is indeed because they discovered the problem here, the beautiful woman said in a deep voice, gazing out the window at the street below. From the looks of it, they've also found a way to remain lucid and rational in this special dream. The man's expression was cold as he nodded slightly and said, but they don't know much yet. They're moving in the wrong direction. Let's get moving. The woman in the feathered hat led the way to the door. The two of them descended the stairs swiftly, one after the other. As they passed the second floor, the woman in the light, colored dress suddenly stopped and whispered, Do you hear something strange? The man in the half-top hat listened intently for a few seconds before hearing faint chewing sounds coming from a room deep on the second floor. The sound persisted without pause. Chapter 679 Spirit Medium Seeing Robert, clad in ice armor and dragging a frost scythe, sprinting towards the stained glass window facing him, Re and Lugano, Camus immediately drew his custom-made revolver and aimed it ahead. At that moment, his feet turned cold and his body froze, causing his joints to become sluggish and his wrists to tremble. From the corner of his eye, Camus observed that although Robert hadn't truly approached, the frost on the ground and the icicles on the wall had already reached him. 
Within a radius of 10 to 20 meters, the chill intensified, resembling the extreme north. With a swoosh, Re shot another arrow entwined with silver lightning. Robert didn't dodge or evade. Exerting strength in his arms, he swung the frosty scythe forward. Clang! The scythe knocked away the arrow, leaving behind a small amount of lightning that raced towards Robert's body. Amidst the sizzling sounds, Robert felt numb for a moment before continuing to sprint towards Re and the others. Camus was taken aback. He wasn't surprised that Robert could control the frost scythe so effortlessly and create a considerable frozen domain. Instead, he was surprised that Robert had rushed up to him and was about to enter a five-meter range. Doesn't he know about my psychic piercing ability? Doesn't he realize that psychic piercing's effective range is five meters? Could it be that he has never encountered or fought a mid-sequence bayonder of the Arbiter pathway? That's true, Camus thought. No one in the patrol team or the Admiral Guard knows that Robert and Miss Amundina are bayonders. After obtaining bayonder powers during the Dream Festival, they probably don't use them much in the outside world. They can only unleash their full potential during the annual Dream Festival. There aren't many Bayonder enemies to choose from. As these thoughts raced through Camus's mind, he seized the opportunity. As Robert stepped within five meters, his eyes lit up with brilliant lightning. Psychic piercing. Two bolts of lightning shot out and pierced Robert's head. Robert let out a blood-curdling scream and tumbled forward, writhing in pain. He had tossed the frost scythe aside. Ree's arrow was once again knocked to the bowstring, instinctively following Robert's roll. Fury blazed in her eyes, erupting from within her body, and her muscles bulged with the surge of power. Raging blow. This was the raging blow Ree had accumulated through her anger. It came from sequence eight folk of rage from the sailor pathway. By releasing accumulated anger, her attack was greatly enhanced. Re was currently at this sequence, but the hunting bow in her hand was a powerful Bayonder item. It was a formidable weapon she had spent all her savings on before arriving in Tizimo. It was called Thunderclap Explosion and could be used for two years. Soon, Robert ceased his tumbling, but he couldn't shake off the intense pain caused by psychic piercing. He froze in place for a moment. Without hesitation, Re watched the arrow, engulfed in dazzling lightning, and released her grip on the bowstring. The arrow shot out, but the lightning on it strangely split into two. One continued to ensnare the arrow, while the other darted to the right. W.H. Re's pupils dilated, unable to comprehend why such a thing had occurred. Instinctively, she turned her head and followed the separated bolt of lightning to its destination. Then, she saw Louis Berry leaning against the window, his eyes tightly shut as he slid down. A few seconds ago, upon hearing Louis Berry's words, Amandina had locked onto him with a mix of confusion and excitement. Since you said it, I won't stand on ceremony. In her spiritual perception, Louis Berry's soul was intertwined with the sinister soul, fiercely resisting while using various parts of his body as a battlefield. However, the owner of the body was clearly at a disadvantage. Amandina couldn't separate them under such circumstances. She vaguely understood why Louis Berry had instructed her to lock onto the other party's head an entangled soul with her spirituality. Lumian, who had Amandina use her abilities, stammered as he struggled to move his left hand in his pocket. His left hand wasn't in his trouser pocket or shirt pocket, but in his traveler's bag. After arriving outside St. Seen Cathedral and prying open the stained glass window, Lumian had inserted his left hand into his traveler's bag, ready to retrieve a suitable mystical item at any moment. He was preparing for the impending battle. If this wasn't a dream, he would likely have his hand in his left shirt pocket where Mr. K's finger was. Before being fully controlled by the wraith, Lumian relied on the strength of a reaper's soul to struggle and retrieve a brooch from his traveler's bag. It was the grayish-white, lightning-shaped brooch known as Fury of the Sea. Lumian gripped the brooch tightly and observed Amandina leaning against the wall. She clenched her fists and closed her eyes. His thoughts suddenly blurred and his eyelids grew heavy. He fell asleep and slowly slid down the wall. 
Padre Kali fell silent in his body. The wraith appeared to be asleep as well. It was unknown if he would fall asleep on his own or if he was affected by the negative effect of now possessing a body. Amandina opened her eyes and was delighted to see this. She wanted to praise herself. With a crackling sound, the bolt of lightning detached from Ree's arrow struck Lumion, transforming into numerous tiny electric serpents that slithered around him. This was the downside of the fury of the sea brooch. Even if Lumion only carried it, there was a high chance of being struck by lightning when he went out in the rain. And if he wore it without attacking anyone else, the likelihood of encountering such a thing would significantly increase. Lumion believed that since the fury of the sea brooch had a chance of attracting lightning strikes on a rainy day, it held a special allure for lightning. In such a situation, although it wasn't raining, what if there was another source of lightning nearby? What would happen? There was a high chance that it would attract a portion of someone else's lightning. Stimulated by the pain of the electric shock, Lumion, no longer affected by the nightmare ability, snapped out of his dream. He regained his senses, but his body remained numb. He experienced this, as did Padre Kali. As soon as the wraith regained consciousness, he instinctively detached from Lumion's body to distance himself from the harm of the electric current. His face materialized on the nearest pane of glass, his form indistinct. Seizing the moment, Lumion donned the grayish-white, lightning-shaped brooch and retrieved his revolver from his traveler's bag. He raised his right hand, aiming at Wraith Kali, who remained in a daze. The Wraith's various colors reflected in Lumion's determined eyes. The pallor rapidly expanded in Lumion's line of sight. Bang! Lumion calmly pulled the trigger, firing a yellow bullet. As he did so, silver-white lightning flickered on the fury of the sea brooch, instantly entering the bullet and wrapping around its surface. This was one of the brooch's abilities. It could grant the wearer an electric shock effect with every strike. After temporarily losing the pride armor, this had become one of Lumion's most effective methods against soul-type creatures. The yellow bullet, engulfed in silver-white lightning, struck the stained glass, shattering it and sending tiny electric currents in all directions. However, it missed Padre Kali. As Lumion pulled the trigger, the wraith vanished from the glass and instantly leaped onto the glass-like surface of the crystal chandelier high above the cathedral. Mirror blink. On the other side, Ree's arrow struck Robert with precision, emitting a resounding bang like a heavy object colliding. Crack. The ice armor covering Robert's body instantly cracked, shattering into fragments that fell to the ground. Under the assault of crackling electric serpents, the blurry shadow attached to his body broke free and vanished into the void. With the ice armor shielding him from most of the damage, Robert remained relatively unaffected. However, his chest tightened and his body briefly went numb. At that moment, he regretted not wearing clothes. The various ingredients needed for his spirit channeling were hidden in his clothes, such as full moon essence oil or corpse incense medication. There were very few spirits that could allow him to communicate safely without the use of materials. The one just now was the most powerful. Seeing Camus's special revolver and Ree's arrows aimed at him, Robert grew anxious. He thought of a spirit channeling method that could be completed under such circumstances. Frowning and fearing the pain, he bit the tip of his tongue. PFFT. He spat out the blood from the tip of his tongue mixed with his saliva, emitting a strange sound from his throat. A pair of weathered, stone-like hands reached out from beneath the cathedral's stone bricks, seized Robert's body, and pulled him underground. At some point in time, the ground had softened like a swamp, and the blood in the air abruptly vanished. Camus's bullets and Ree's arrows arrived one after another, but they only caused sparks on the stone bricks on the ground. Spirit Medium Camus used this opportunity to revise his judgment of Robert's pathway and sequence. He's actually not from the same pathway as Miss Amandina. Hadn't he also obtained his superpowers from the black boulder? Camus hastily took a few steps back, retrieved a cartridge bag, and began reloading the revolver. As a member of Matani's authorities, obtaining Bayonder bullets with different effects was relatively easy. 
even though the patrol team wasn't wealthy or had much accumulation. After all, there was the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, the God of Steam and Machinery Church, the Church of Earth Mother, and numerous adventurers coming and going. Furthermore, the patrol team needed to be vigilant against certain branches of the Rose School of Thought and the Numinous Episcopate. They had to make targeted preparations. Camus swiftly inserted the golden purifying bullets into the revolver's cylinder and snapped it shut. At that moment, Padre Kali, who had leaped onto another stained glass window, reappeared. He opened his mouth and emitted a piercing shriek that harmed one's eardrums and spirit body. Ah! Wraith Shriek, Chapter 680, Combat Experience Camus, who had just loaded the purifying bullets into his revolver cylinder, heard a sharp sound of static in his mind. Before his eyes, the world seemed to separate from him, a chunk of transparent glass forming a barrier between him and reality. Under the wraith's shriek, cracks appeared on the glass, extending into the spirit body. A faint shattering sound reverberated in the ears of Lumian, Re, Lugano, Amandina, Robert, who had just crawled out of the ground near the altar, and the other naked men frantically dodging. It brought sharp pain to their eardrums, blood to their noses, and agony from the depths of their souls. Almost everyone froze in place like fragile porcelain caught in an invisible storm. The naked men, who appeared ordinary, fainted without a sound. Blood seeped from their eyes, nostrils, mouths, ears, and skin. However, Lumian, who had advanced to Sequence Five Reaper, suffered the least damage and recovered the fastest. Thin ice crystal arrows shot at him, their arrowheads flickering with a cold light. In an instant, Lumian made a decision. He didn't transform into a shadow creature or enter the shadows to dodge the damage, nor did he attempt to duck. Instead, blazing white flames ignited over his body. He transformed into a burning white spear and hurled himself towards the stained glass window closer to the door, facing the ice crystal arrows. Padre Kali, with his dark brown skin and sinister expression, stood there. Amandina was the second to recover from the wraith's shriek. She witnessed the majestic blazing white flaming spear collide with the ice crystal arrows hurtling towards them. Silently, a portion of the ice crystal arrows facing the blazing white flaming spear evaporated into sizzling white gas, while the surrounding ones quickly melted and turned to steam. White mist caused by water steam filled the air. Although the blazing white flaming spear had dimmed significantly and stopped burning violently, it still pierced through and headed straight for the stained glass that revealed Padre Kali's figure. Similar ice crystal arrows pierced through the white mist, striking Amandina, Camus, Re, and Lugano. However, they either melted or shrunk significantly, reducing their speed. Amandina and Camus, who had just escaped the wraith's shriek, easily dodged. Although Re and Lugano couldn't react in time and were hit by the ice crystal arrows, they only felt a slight pain, as if a child had hit them with a snowball. It was a little painful, but mostly wet and cold. They seized the opportunity to snap out of their days almost at the same time as Robert at the altar. Crack. The blazing white flaming spear struck the stained glass, shattering it into countless pieces. However, Padre Kali had already leaped onto the window that Lumian had pried open, narrowly escaping the attack. As the flames of the burning white spear dissipated, Lumian's figure emerged from the fading light. Without hesitation, he ignited white flames once more, transforming into a majestic spear that shot towards the window where Padre Kali had appeared, determined to pursue his enemy. He deliberately refrained from teleporting and repeatedly transformed into a flaming spear, hoping to lull Padre Kali into overlooking such possibilities. Then, at a critical moment, he would unexpectedly appear beside him and use the spell of Harumph, catching the wraith off guard. Otherwise, it would be challenging to catch a wraith that could constantly jump through mirrored objects, using them as portals to evade capture. Furthermore, Lumian knew that wraiths could be considered spirit world creatures to a certain extent. They could also use the spirit world to complete teleportation, although they couldn't compare to spirit world creatures specialized in this area. Nevertheless, it wasn't an ability to be underestimated. 
As the fireball spear hurtled toward the window Lumion had pried open, Robert rolled to the side of the altar where their clothes were, intending to retrieve the ingredients used for spirit channeling. Swoosh! An arrow pierced the stone bricks in front of him, forcing him to change the direction of his roll at the last moment, narrowly avoiding the projectile. As soon as Ree regained her composure, she aimed at Robert and launched an attack. Both she and Camus believed that Louis Berry could handle Padre Kali on his own, so their mission was to restrain Robert and capture this key figure, preventing him from interfering in the battle. As a gunshot rang out, Padre Kali's figure vanished from the stained glass window, leaving no trace of his presence. The eyes of Amandina, who was nearby, reflected the image of the naked fallen Padre. Amandina wanted to resist, but her body quickly turned cold, gradually defying her will as an unknown force took control of her actions. Amidst the sloshing sounds, Lumion's blazing white flaming spear pierced through the stained glass and landed outside the cathedral, three to four meters away from Amandina, its heat radiating in the cool night air. As the flames dissipated, Lumion appeared, clad in a golden straw hat, a white shirt, and a black vest. At that moment, Amandina's hands had already involuntarily risen. The corners of her beautiful face curled into a sinister and smug smile. Come on, attack me. Amandina would be the first to be injured and die. If the body can't protect me, I can still jump and shift positions in time. Padre Kali was wary of Amandina's ability to forcefully pull people into dreams, a power that could easily turn the tide of battle. This time he chose to possess her instead of Louis Berry, an enemy at a higher sequence, hoping to use her as a shield against Lumion's attacks. As Padre Kali manipulated Amandina's body with a sinister and smug smile, he saw Louis Berry's lips curve into a radiant smile. As a wraith, Padre Kali had a strong spiritual premonition, and he suddenly sensed extreme danger. Pa! A pale yellow light burst forth from Lumion's laughter and landed on Amandina, who stood three to four meters away, enveloping her spirit and Padre Kali, who couldn't use mirror blink in time. Lumion honestly found it a pleasant surprise. You know about Nightmare's abilities, but don't you know how to guard against the spell of Haramph? Oh, you really don't. You don't know this ability, nor do you know that I'm capable of it. However, as a wraith, you can continuously mirror jump, yet you insist on attaching yourself to one of my teammates and remain within a few meters of me. What kind of belief is this? Don't you have enough combat experience? Even if you didn't know the spell of Haramph, you have to guard against abilities like psychic piercing. Oh, you think Camus is far away, so there's no need to worry about it. As a sequence 5 of the Hunter Pathway, how would I know this? Are you hoping to use me to quickly kill Amandina? Haven't you considered the existence of mystical items? My original plan was if I failed to finish you off after using teleportation to deliver the spell of Haramph and Kull, I would feign a strategic retreat and find a small space to set up the bottle of fiction. Then, when you caught up, I would fight you in a cramped and sealed space, just like how I dealt with Hisoka back then. To my surprise, you delivered yourself to me. As Lumion criticized wildly, Padre Kali and Amandina fainted and collapsed to the ground. Had it been during his battle with Hisoka some time ago, Lumion would have hastened to follow through with the subsequent steps. This was because the spell of Haramph couldn't render a Sequence 5 enemy unconscious for long. However, now that he had advanced to Sequence 5, his spell of Haramph had become significantly stronger. The time he could control a wraith had increased, although it was still limited to a few seconds. Lumion retrieved a few special bullets from his traveler's bag. They had been purchased through Camus from the patrol team. Two exorcism and two purification bullets, both golden in color. Lumion swiftly loaded the four bullets into the cylinder of his revolver and aimed at Amandina, who lay on the ground. Catching sight of this from the corner of his eye, Camus jumped in fright and shouted, What are you doing? Saving her, Lumion replied calmly. Then he pulled the trigger. Bang! The golden exorcism bullet struck Amandina's shoulder, causing her to bleed and emit a golden sunlight. 
Amandina woke up in pain, and the apparition of Padre Kali detached from her body, his face warped under the sunlight. Originally, with the strength of the exorcism bullets, it would have been impossible to expel a wraith from the victim's body in an instant. However, Padre Kali was unconscious and unable to react effectively. Lumian raised his gun, his eyes reflecting the color on the surface of Padre Kali's spirit body. He locked onto the pallor that had become evident. Bang! A golden purifying bullet, imbued with Kull's power, struck the wraith's forehead. The apparition of Padre Kali froze as he saw the bullet shatter on its own, transforming into balls of golden holy flames that spread throughout his body, igniting dust and his soul. The bright, sun-like golden flames swiftly enveloped Padre Kali, causing him to let out a tragic scream. This wasn't a wraith shriek, but it still made everyone's heads and ears hurt. Lumian endured these sensations and calmly said to Amandina, Drag him into a dream and inquire about the source of the dream festival. Padre Kali had already been subjected to coal and was severely weakened, teetering on the brink of true death. Amandina could effectively restrain him, but Amandina's shoulder and head ached, but she didn't dare complain when she saw Louis Berry's cold and calm expression. Lumian turned to Lugano and said, Treat her gunshot wound. All right. Lugano winced from the pain in his eardrums, but he still rushed over. At that moment, Padre Kali, purified by the call, instinctively withdrew from his wraith state and transformed back into a human to escape the ongoing damage. Seeing this, Amandina took a deep breath, clenched her fists, and closed her eyes. She and Padre Kali entered the dream at the same time. 